Thank you. So um, I'm Lucas Buwald, and I run a company called Crowdflower. And what we do is we take simple, repetitive jobs, typically for big companies, and we send them to people all around the web, including people inside games like um, Farmville here. So I just, I always do this. Can I get a show of hands? Who here has heard of crowdsourcing? I'm just messing with you guys. I mean, it's amazing. I've been, like, I've actually, I've gotten nervous giving this talk because I've been learning so much about um, crowdsourcing and collaboration while I'm here. Like, I've been learning about, like, meshes and um, starfish. And it's, it's been fascinating how much the public sector is actually leading the private sector um, in this kind of collaboration. I think it makes sense because there's this long history of people volunteering and people getting involved with um, government. But I thought the one sort of interesting thing that I could really share with you guys is um, how I sell crowdsourcing to typically Fortune 500 companies that really wouldn't like to hear the term meshy. Like they wouldn't look at, they wouldn't say like, oh, meshy, that sounds cool and I should do that. They look at meshy like, this sounds really problematic and difficult. And I go to them and I say, look, guys, I'm going to take some really important business process that you have and I'm going to take that process and I'm going to send it out to hundreds of thousands of strangers that I don't even have a strong connection with. And the reason they don't throw me out of the room at that point is because of this ugly graph that I have right here, which is showing that we can scale up to the equivalent of thousands of FTEs or kind of man day equivalents and then back down. And this is really, really important for people that are in a big hurry to clean up a database or to get something ready for a product launch. And this is the reason that all of our customers buy um, crowdsourcing. It's not what I thought it was. It's not because it's cheaper. It's not because it's um, higher quality. I mean, it is those things, but it's, it's really been the scalability that's uh, made it work. And it's also been scalability that's, that's driven the sort of uh, public interest projects that I've seen, um, like the Haiti project, which, uh, which Patrick from Ushahidi came and talked about last year, but this was a project to, um, they collected tons and tons of text messages right after the earthquake, and they had volunteers that spoke English, and all the text messages were in Creole. And so they suddenly, on that day that the earthquake happened, needed tons and tons of Creole, English, bilingual people to do the translations, right? And so this is a perfect example of crowdsourcing. They took this and they put it on the web, and they had all these people, all, this is like the Haitian diaspora here, all these dots represent people that actually spoke Creole and did a Creole to English um, translation. And it was the only way that you could fulfill a demand for Creole English translators that looks like this, right? Where suddenly you need thousands of people, and then over time you need less and less um, of these people. And I think that that project went went really, really well. Um, but I think that it went really well because there were so many smart, hardworking people that helped with it, getting involved in the chat rooms um, and making sure that people were understanding the directions they had. Uh, an interesting example um, is the, the search for Stephen Fawcett, which is a project that didn't go so well because it wasn't managed quite as well. So this is another really good example of crowdsourcing in theory where you have an airplane that went down, right? And they took satellite photos of all the area that the airplane went down. And they put this up on a website called Mechanical Turk, and they got 50,000 people to come in and look at uh, small photos of where the airplane might have crashed. Right? So suddenly you have 50,000 people covering this huge area where the airplane might have crashed, and the director in charge of the search and rescue said, this was a big problem. It actually didn't help me um, with my job. It hurt me with my job because they put contact information for her on the website here, right? So suddenly you have 50,000 people, and if even 1% of them decide they want to bug the person that's running the operation, it's going to be a lot of people that are bugging. Apparently she had to take out a restraining order um, on one person that just like, kept calling with information, right? So this is you know, the first time they did it. It's a great idea. I hope they keep um, doing it. But it sort of shows you how smart the guys um, at Ushahidi and Frontline SMS were um, in their design of the, um, the project in Haiti. And you know, we actually helped um, in Pakistan um, with the floods, to do the exact same thing, where you're translating uh, messages from the local languages into English and categorizing them for volunteers. And this was really exciting for me because it was taking a really good process and making it scalable, right? We were able to do it um, a second time and do it really much, with much less um, effort the second time around. I hope we do this um, in every major disaster. And um, you know, I just wanted to say that you know, Clay Shirky, I loved his line and it actually inspired my business, right? That people spend 100 million hours in a weekend watching commercials, right? And I've built a useful business on that, but 
there's lots and lots of hours still left to take, right? And you guys should use that to help um, save the world. There's a great company called Sparked where you can sign up and do this kind of um, micro-volunteerism. Thank you.